Hey. Um, I want to talk in this video specifically about two individuals, um, but also wider issues around uh, around these two individuals. Um, and it's something I have quite strong views on and something that I feel is important to talk about, although it's not politically correct to do so. Um, the two individuals we're going to talk about is Nelson Mandela and Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, from the outset of this video, I want to make it very clear that to a very large extent, I have a lot of respect and admiration for these two. Um, they are two of the world's most prominent um, humanitarian leaders, so to speak. Um, and the, the circumstances around their lives are somewhat similar, though, of course, not the same. Uh, Mandela spent 27 years in jail fighting against a racist apartheid system, and he emerged as uh, a leader respected by millions of people. Um, similarly, Aung San Suu Kyi spent years under house arrest, and she was involved in a very long struggle against the, the Burmese junta. Um, the situation in Burma has changed insofar as she has been uh, somewhat reinstated into the political system. But there are grave issues facing Burma today, uh, uh, though the UNTA has moderated their stance towards her and her, her political party. Burma continues to have grave challenges, and so does South Africa. Now, the one, one obvious difference between these two people is that Nelson Mandela has passed away, and Aung San Suu Kyi is still alive. So there's a slightly different context. Now, in order to address the points I want to make in this, I'm going to not talk about them both at once, but rather talk about uh, Nelson Mandela first and then Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, the, the pretext of this, or context perhaps is a better word, is that I feel that uh, in the case of Mandela especially, there is a, a level of adulation that is um, to the extent whereby if you say anything critical of Mr. Mandela, then you're immediately branded in a certain way. If you say anything critical of Mr. Mandela at all, uh, a lot of, frankly, black people and some white liberals automatically assume that you're a racist or that you supported apartheid or a wide range of other uh, smears that they would put against you. Now, I've just watched part of an interview from 1990, the same year Mandela was released. He was given this in the United States. And there was a, a guy stood up, a black guy, actually. I'm not sure if it was a senator or a congressman or someone. But he said, loads of us who believe in human rights have been disappointed by some of the statements that you've made in recent months, Mr. Mandela, whereby you have praised Fidel Castro, Yasser Arafat and Muammar Gaddafi uh, somehow being champions of human rights. Now, Mandela's response was uh, something along the lines of do not assume that because they're your enemies, um, they, they cannot be in this position. Something along those lines is not an exact quotation. But the point is he was refuting the, the point that was being made was that his position as a humanitarian seemed contradictory when he was quoting figures who are clearly anything but um, democratic leaders. Um, okay, Yasser Arafat may be democratic in the city was supported by a lot of Palestinians, but the idea that these guys were human rights leaders, I think is an utter insult to the idea. And um, Mandela's position is contradictory. The, the thing is, when you have somebody who is so admired and so adulated by so many people, they do become um, almost cast in marble. And anyone who dares say anything against them, anyway, the, the response of the audience was sort of wild cheering for Mandela's answer. Uh, I, I didn't watch the whole video, but I watched a fair bit of it. And the crowd just seemed sort of programmed to cheer Mandela no matter what he said, every single answer he gave. Now, I don't have a problem with people admiring Mr. Mandela, but to me, there was no objectivity whatsoever in the outlook of that crowd. Um, and I find this with a lot of people who slavishly adulate Mandela, uh, make excuses for everything he said and done. Now, I said at the start of the video, I admire him. And I'm not just saying that 
sound good. I really, really do. I think he was a remarkable figure. Um, he spent 27 years in prison and he forgave the people who put him there. That shows an incredible strength of character. And he was a very brave man in that sense. There's no question about it. There's also no question that he was an inspiration to millions of people. Nothing takes that away. Um, and it is also critical to point out the role he played in preventing South Africa from ending up an outright civil war, which he did do. Uh, South Africa in the early 90s was a pretty violent place and it could have well have ended up in an outright civil war. Um, but the role that he played and the role that F.W. de Klerk played prevented South Africa heading to outright civil war. And for that reason, Mandela is rightly seen as a very strong leader. Um, some of his successors have not lived up to his name. Uh, Tabo and Becky, Jacob Zuma and others have not quite lived up to Mandela's name. And I think part of the problem of that is they haven't fully addressed South Africa's chronic problems of crime with inequality. I think today the biggest threat that South Africa has is social inequality. Apartheid's gone, but social inequality remains a serious issue. So does violent crime and corruption and a number of other big problems. I remember it was quite poignant that during Mandela's funeral, uh, I believe it was Jacob Zuma was booed during the, the proceedings. Now, the difficulty in saying any of these things in terms of a, a critical analysis of some of Mandela's legacy is people sort of get very defensive and reactionary they think what is wrong with you you're criticizing this great man um you're a minnow you're nobody but i think it is dangerous thinking or um i think it is not progressive thinking to put anybody anybody on a mantle of being above all crit criticism or all scrutiny and that unfortunately is what some mandela um diehard mandela supporters they do seem to have that mentality. And it irritates me when anyone says anything about this. People always say, oh, you're a Republican. You, uh, as in US political Republican, you, you're a racist. You support apartheid ETC. I believe it is completely compatible to hate the apartheid system and recognize it was a vicious racist system and recognize the important role Mandela played in fighting that, but also point out that he was far from perfect. And that some of his positions were contradictory and were questionable. Um, now, there's often reference made to the violent activities of some of Mandela's supporters, especially the so-called necklacing um, approach, which was basically the vicious lynching um, of especially black people, in fact, particularly black people, who didn't explicitly support Mandela and his movement. Um, I know Winnie Mandela was often accused of leading these mobs, but this was a very vicious practice. It was putting petrol inside the rim of a tire, throwing it around someone's head. Now, to be fair, the film Mandela Long Walk to Freedom, the recent film, they, they did show this, so they didn't gloss it over. They showed that, and I'm pleased that they did. Um, for his part, Mandela, to be fair, he never condoned that, that particular technique. Um, although he did, uh, he was never a pacifist. He did call for an armed struggle. Um, he also weighed in and condemned that sort of uh, approach. So you know, we need to recognise that Mandela was responsible in that sense. Um, but it does irritate me that whenever anybody has anything critical to say whatsoever, they kind of get shamed into being quiet because they. They're accused of being racist or they're accused of supporting apartheid, whatever. I think that's ridiculous. Um, whilst it's certainly true that there would be genuine racists who hold that position, to then make a sweeping statement and say, unless you slavishly worship Nelson Mandela, then you're a vicious racist. It really, it really makes me angry. It's a very negative way of thinking and it's a very narrow way of thinking, actually. Mandela was a great man, but he was a man. He was flawed. Um, and some of his positions were questionable. So the guy who asked that question, I'm not sure who it was, but it was a valid question, i.e. Mandela's position was contradictory. To say that he was, I mean, be a leader of a uh, clearly humanitarian cause, i.e. the anti-apartheid struggle, and yet to make excuses for 
in the case of Gaddafi, especially a brutal dictator. I mean, that is hypocritical. It's hypocritical to campaign for the freedom of one group of people, i.e. black South Africans, and then not give a damn about Libyan dissidents. Um, and in the case of Castro, well, you know, it's just, it's just an, a ridiculous thing to say that uh, a communist state is, is, a, is a free state. It's just anyone who's studied the history of communism would know that's blatantly not true. Now, I think what Mandela was doing was playing politics with his humanitarian position. I think his position on that was much more ideological than humanitarian. And it was basically because, obviously because Africa has had a long history of anti-colonialist struggles. Mandela was among many leaders who was associated with that. Um, he had to be consistent in that regard. But that inevitably meant abandoning his um, role on general humanitarian issues. Now, I remember when Mugabe, a few years back, when some terrible things were happening in Zimbabwe, a number of people criticized Mandela for being silent and not condemning Mugabe's record. And I think the reason for that was that Mugabe had also been seen as a, a sort of anti-colonialist hero. But I do think there is a problem in the continent of Africa in that uh, far too often there are excuses made for leaders that end up as brutal dictators. And the excuses are on in the context of, oh, well, these guys started off as anti-colonialist guerrillas freedom fighters, so they're generally admired, so we'll just turn a blind eye to all the bad things they do. And it's also a big Western conspiracy. You see that all the time with Mugabe. Um, if you look at a video about Mugabe, there are a lot of people, um, especially from Africa, who make excuses for him and say it's some sort of Western conspiracy against him. The facts are this. The country of Zimbabwe, for example, has been independent for over 30 years. Mugabe, as head of state, is fully responsible for what happens in that country. And the same way any leader anywhere is responsible for what happens in his or her country. So frankly, I get very sick and tired of constantly, constantly blaming outsiders for Africa's problems. Um, I'm not saying this is a universal case. I'm not saying everybody does this. There are objective people who recognize that a lot of these problems are brought about by political decisions and by the selfish power grab of a lot of these leaders and selfishly, you know, uh, refusing to step down when their time is up. Um, you know, Africa has had perpetual suffering in the, in the past. It was largely brought about by colonialism. So I'm not trying to make excuses for colonialism here. What I'm saying is you cannot always use colonialism as an excuse for Africa's problems. And I'm, I'm pretty critical of Pan-Africanism in today's context in the sense that I believe it is, it's basically used, uses colonialism as an excuse for every single problem Africa has. And I utterly reject that. I mean, for example, trying to blame the insurgency of Boko Haram on the fact that Nigeria was once a British colony is clearly absurd. Um, because Islamism is a, is a problem that can be seen in many places that weren't actually colonized. So it's, you know, it's not a valid argument in my opinion. I believe that Africa needs to start taking responsibility, responsibility and not constantly blame uh, the outside world for its problems. I mean, this isn't to say that uh, colonial powers didn't have a role to play. They had a very big role to play. I'm not glossing that over, but I just reject this sweeping notion that all of Africa's problems can be blamed on colonialism. I think that's a cop-out. And in my opinion, and with independence comes responsibility of nationhood. Every independent country has a responsibility to itself. So there's a contradiction in a lot of the African arguments of, oh, uh, let's blame colonialism for everything. And then sometimes almost in the same sentence saying, oh, why are they not helping us when we've got this problem? So you can't have it both ways. Either you accept that today African countries are responsible for sorting themselves out, sorting out the internal problems that they have, or you say, well, yes, we do need Western help, but we're, we're not going to sort of uh, turn around and then blame these countries 
for the problems that, and then ask them for help. It's it's ridiculous. It's a contradictory position to take, in my opinion. The reason Africa has the problems it has, I mean, put it this way, right? If it really is a result of colonialism, if all of Africa's problems are a result of colonialism, how do you explain the fact that a country like Vietnam has a very fast-growing GDP? How do you explain the fact that a country like Indonesia has a very fast-growing GDP? And they're considerably, they're not wealthy, but they are certainly a lot wealthier than most African countries. And yet they too were colonized. Vietnam was colonized by the French. Indonesia was colonized by the Dutch around the same time as African countries were colonized. So I don't believe you can use colonialism as an excuse to explain all the problems that Africa specifically faces. And to get back to Mandela, um, I find that a lot of people who slavishly adulate him tend to buy into that sort of thinking. Now, Mandela was a great man. There is no question about that. I have a lot of respect for him, but that doesn't mean that he was perfect. And I do think that his positions were contradictory, and it was right that people challenged him on that. It was right that people said, well, look, Mr. Mandela, how can you, uh, you know, call for freedom for one group of people and then act as an apologist for some brutal dictators in other parts of the world? That's contradictory. So that's Nelson Mandela. The other person that I wanted to speak about is Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, the circumstances aren't exactly the same. And Aung San Suu Kyi never, one big difference with the Mandela is she never called for an armed struggle in the same way. Burma is a country that has obviously been wrecked by brutal dictatorship and internal civil wars, various insurgencies for the last 50, 60 years. Um, she's had a very big role to play in the humanitarian struggle against the junta. And if you've seen the film of the Lady, that really exemplifies why Aung San Suu Kyi is admired by so many people, myself included. But there has been growing criticism in recent uh, years of her pretty much silence on the persecution of the Rohingya people. If you don't know, these are a Muslim majority um, minority in Burma, primarily, uh, as I understand it, in Rakhine State. They are Burmese citizens, um, but they're of Bangladeshi origin. Bangladesh won't accept them. Um, Burma treats them like dirt, and now there is a humanitarian crisis. They are the boat people of the 2010s, along with those migrants in the Mediterranean. This is an absolute humanitarian catastrophe. There's reports coming through that uh, Burmese refugees are attacking the Rohingya on the boats. Uh, women are being raped, and men are being hacked up. Um, and it's quite obvious that this is a group that faces incredible persecution. Um, definitely comparable to the Palestinians, if not much worse. And yet there seems to be a silence from much of the um, so-called Islamic world on the persecution of these people. Now, why is that? I'm just opening that as, up as a question. But anyway, I want to talk about Aung San Suu Kyi's role. Firstly, uh, we have to be clear, she's not the president of Burma. So the power that she has is limited. Okay, so I totally acknowledge that. And I think it would be completely unreasonable to expect one person to do everything. And, and the same principle with Mandela. No individual person, no matter how admirable, can be expected to do everything. Um, so I don't think anyone realistically expects Aung San Suu Kyi to just be like superwoman and go in and save the Rohingya. But as a senior Burmese politician, and as someone who has long spoken about uh, her love of the Burmese people, and how much she wants to free them from the, the the tyranny of the junta, it is hard to understand and comprehend why she is so passive on the plight of the Rohingya, who have to be among the most persecuted people in the world. And I, I'm not sure what her constituency is, but surely as someone who actually won the democratic uh, um, democratic mandate in Burma, um, you know she had the majority of votes, but the junta obviously took power. Um, she is pretty much has a mandate to be president and everything but name. So she has a responsibility to say something. I mean, I don't think she's got a major risk at this stage. I don't think the Junta is going to go back and put her back in prison at this stage. Because they know that uh, with their easing of 
the campaign against her, there has been more investment. So in that sense, Burma has improved, but in many other ways, the situation has deteriorated in terms of the the persecution of the Rohingya. So the point I'm making is she has nothing to lose by speaking out. I'm not saying that she should do everything um, herself, but at the very least, someone of her status, someone of her um, reputation could have some significance. Um, and, you know, some people might say, oh, well, you know, why expect her to do it? Why don't you do something? The point is there is a limited amount that outsiders could do. I could sign petitions. I could go and volunteer for a charity and work on the field and maybe give medicine to people. But it would be very limited how much I could do. Um, on the other hand, she is in the Burmese parliament. She is in a position of power, not absolute power, but nevertheless in a position of authority. She can at the very least say something. And so far, her position on this has been, at best, passive. So I am disappointed in her, and I think a lot of people are. And I cannot comprehend why she's not saying anything. Maybe this is politics. Maybe she feels it would be, it will cost in the long term to say something. Maybe she thinks it may make the situation worse. Whatever her rationale for being passive is, she needs to explain that. Because the longer she stays silent on this issue, the more her reputation is being damaged. And it's really, really unfortunate because she, she was an admired figure. Um, she still should be admired for all the work that she's done. But to me, these two people I've quoted, they're both in their own way great people, brave people, um, admirable people in many, many ways. But to me, this demonstrates that no human being is above scrutiny or should be above scrutiny. And no human being um, is a messiah. They're just not. And anyone who thinks that they are really, really need to consider the things that I'm talking about. So, in the case of Mandela, if he was truly consistent with his humanitarian world outlook, then he should not have been making excuses for some, in some cases, brutal dictators, simply because they were anti-Western. And maybe that bought and uh, I do think that was a political move. I think Mandela was being populist with that. And with Aung San Suu Kyi, maybe she's doing something similar. Maybe the reason she's not speaking out for the Rohingya is because there is racial discrimination against them and she doesn't want to lose support of the Buddhist majority. If that is a reason, then that is, frankly, um, it's not the sort of strength that she showed in the past. And it's quite a cynical move. Um, you know, she's 68 years old. Maybe she's getting fatigued from politics. But if that is the case, then she should step down. But, you know, to stay silent when these people are among the most persecuted people in the world. It's just very disappointing. And I hope she says something soon because this situation cannot continue. You know, she might resent the fact that people expect her to say something, but no one forced her to take on these roles. Okay? I understand that there was an expectation that she should, but it's not like um, people forced her to become this leader. Um, she was clearly driven by passion herself. This is clearly, she clearly was driven by passion for the Burmese people. I mean, she made some very difficult life choices, including a choice between going back to the UK to visit her dying husband or staying in Burma to stand up for the Burmese people. She chose the latter. That shows the strength of her compassion. She didn't have to do that. She knew that if she went back to the UK, the Junta would have cut her off from going back to Burma. So it was an incredibly difficult choice she had to make. And it's admirable that she had the courage to make that. But I do think she should be doing a lot more on this issue. And I cannot comprehend why she's not. Um, people will say it's easy for you to criticise. Well, I've never been somebody to sort of say, oh, leaders should do everything. Um, I've, I've never argued that, and I'm not arguing it now. But what I'm saying is that there is a misguided perception that someone like Nelson Mandela or Aung San Suu Kyi or I'm sure you can name any number of other leaders, just because they're admir admirable for one thing doesn't mean that they never made mistakes. And it doesn't mean that all their positions are morally justifiable. Mandela was an intelligent man, but he wasn't all-knowing. You know, his philosophy, was, I believe it was right to scrutinize some of his positions. I mean, after all, he ended up as a head of state. And like any head of state, um, 
you know, why should he be above scrutiny? Um, and don't forget Mandela's legacy as president. Um, you know, it wasn't a perfect legacy. He didn't solve all of South Africa's problems, and nor would he should he be expected to. But the point is, sometimes I see comments, especially about Nelson Mandela, which are just blindly adulating the man, and I really have a problem with that. Um, as someone who admires Mandela. Now, I, I appreciate that some people would say, well, if you were a black person who lived under apartheid, you would worship him in the same way. I appreciate that, that there is a context to that. I do understand. But I still think that if uh, if you want to really be objective on these issues, then you need to look at everything. And, you know, there's no... I cannot see how Mandela could have condoned certain dictatorships, which have brutal human rights records. It is inconsistent. And the final thing, just because people say something that you don't like to hear about a leader that you admire does not mean that person supports the opposite ideology or doesn't support the sort of uh, general movement or campaign that the leader represents. So just because someone criticizes Nelson Mandela doesn't mean that they support apartheid. It does not mean that. In some cases, it might be the case. But to, to make a sweeping statement and say that that is the position of everyone who has ever criticized Mandela in every way, it's ridiculous. I mean, there's something of a personality cult um, around Nelson Mandela. Um, despite him being a democratic leader, and I'm not comfortable with it, and I don't agree with it. Now, you can hate me, you can send angry message to this video, whatever, I don't really care, because the most important thing to me is speaking with conviction. I'm simply sharing my opinions here. I still, I still admire Nelson Mandela, I still admire Aung San Suu Kyi, but the final point I'm making here is that those who argue that I mean, I saw one guy actually saying Mandela is God. That's the sort of rubbish that I'm talking about. No, he wasn't. He was not a perfect human being. He was admir an admirable, strong human being, but he made mistakes. And some of his positions were morally questionable, actually. Let me know your thoughts.